Welcome to the Sirius Report. This is Paul, clearly from the Sirius Report. And we're very pleased that uh, Dario's joined us again on Friday, uh, obviously the 15th of November. So Dario, welcome and thanks for joining us again. We really enjoyed the last time you were on and we got a lot of really good feedback from people who shared our view, and rightly so. So welcome. Thanks a lot, Paul, and I'm happy to be here again. So what would you like to discuss today? So um, for today, I think that um, there are actually two, two topics that um, are not very well covered uh, um, throughout like mainstream media and uh, uh, social network. Like the, the, first, the first topic is um, what exactly China is doing with their current policies in order to stimulate the economy. And the second topic is what is the real state of the German economy and where is heading and what are in particular the problems that still are being kept, I would say, hidden from the public eye. Yeah, and there are two great topics and we obviously had a brief chat before we came on air and I wholeheartedly share your sentiment they're two very poorly understood areas and you know particularly China from my perspective because I have a great interest in it as you know and everyone who's listening knows but also I've been paying more attention to Germany in the last couple of years unsurprisingly particularly since the onset of the Ukraine war my interest revolved principally as what would happen when Germany was cut off from cheap Russian energy and we'll park that thought for now. So without further ado, let's dive into China then. Yeah, sure. So well, about China, um, there is um, one element that I realized is um, particularly misunderstood of what's happening. Uh, misunderstood. In, in the Western part of the world, like mostly because here they have been like very straightforward since the very beginning. So what are these 1.8 trillion of bonds that China is going gonna, is gonna to issue uh, in the following years? That, by the way, to put this in, into perspective, we are talking about like a couple of months of uh, increasing depth of the U.S. economy. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big amount, but, you know, people should have, like, the proper consideration when they talk about uh, bazooka and whatever it takes, in my humble opinion. So what are these bonds going to be used for? So right now in China, but let me be clear, this is not a problem of China alone. It's a problem of many countries. and. Uh, even in my own country, in Italy, we have this issue. When you have companies that do provide services to the local authorities, usually the amount of time needed to be paid tends to be long. Why? Because, of course, the local authorities give greater priorities to the essential services, maintenance, and so on. And then with what is left um, extra in the budget, they pay the creditors. And when they cannot pay the creditors, usually these creditors, and here is an example of Italy, they get tax credit. But of course, in order to be able to use tax credit, you need to generate revenues, remain in operation, and so on. So what's the issue? in China and what China is truly addressing right now. There is a lot of government debt that is not at the central level, but is at the local authorities level that effectively is of the type of nature I just described. Services were provided, but then because of you know, what happened during 
during COVID uh, and because of the consequence of too much um, speculation and overbuilding uh, and, the Aussie, and the Aussie bubble, the local governments effectively found themselves uh, uh, incapable of generating enough local revenues to, to pay their own debt. And in particular, the most of the local revenues that were generated during the booming year, let's call it like this, were actually coming from selling land that, to be technically correct, is not land that is, that is sold. In reality, the land has been leased for 70 years in China. So the developers, they buy rights to build on this land and then... Uh, this uh, effectively like the construction become a leasehold that are then purchased um, by their clients. Okay, so in the moment in, in we in which like the, all this you know continuous bidding for land stopped, what happened is that the revenues of the local authorities dramatically dropped. Okay, so if you have this step on a local level okay and this debt actually is bilateral debt is debt directly with counterparts what is a problem of this type of debt the problem is is very difficult to move in the financial system okay because effectively you need to take a contract you need to um, factorize the contract against another lender that is willing to be a direct um, counterpart, but then again, it will be very difficult to sell. So, what China is doing effectively is allowing them to issue debt in the form of securities, in the form of bond. And let me be very clear there is a huge demand for Chinese government bond at the moment. Why? Because the saving rate of Chinese people is astonishing. Okay. They are pretty famous about this. Okay. And the risk of sentiment from the financial lenders and the financial community at the moment is pretty high. And actually is, is, is becoming a problem for China to a certain extent. Why? Because all this overbidding of government bonds is suppressing the yield more than where they want them to be. And effectively, the government is scared that if yields start to get too low, this uh, might actually um, create other bubbles in other parts of the economy that they don't want to deal with. Okay? So... You have this, uh, this strong demand and effectively you have a potential supply there. So what's happening here is called a swap. Okay. A swap to a certain extent is a zero sum game in the financial system, but effectively is beneficial to the financial system because you shift the risk from people that cannot bear or manage them to people that uh, have appetite and the resources to bear and manage them. So effectively, they will issue these bonds. These bonds will be bought by the financial community that is very eager to purchase government bonds. The cash will be used to repay this, um, let's call it like debt that is off the book, okay? So the contractors that will receive this money, what are they going to do with that? They are going to pay off their own debt. And especially in the case of real estate developer, there is a very, very powerful direction from the government. They need to complete the project that they left unbuilt. And that was the biggest issue because in a continued, you know, uh, craze to to build 
uh, new real estate development uh, during like the crazy years, what was happening is that they were purchasing land. They were starting a construction. Apartments were sold on paper. People were getting their mortgages. Okay. At the same time, they were paying their rents. They were paying basically their apartments, like either the upfront, but m- many times even in full. But rather than using this money to complete the buildings, what this real estate developer did was effectively to use that money to buy more land and leverage themselves. To a certain point, this went basically out of control that the government had to, you know, really slam the brakes and said, okay, that's it, enough. This is, uh, this is completely unsustainable. We cannot have a housing market where the price to income at some point was above 50. In some city above 70 times the annual income of a person. Just to give you an idea, if my memory is correct, I think in New York, it's like the average is like 15. And it's considered an expensive, very expensive city worldwide. Okay? So you get this local debt of the shadow. You shift this debt on willing buyers that have the capital. And by the way, the China is going to inject, as they announced, 140 billion plus dollar equivalent of capital in their banking system in order to support what I'm talking about. Now, the liquidity that has been raised from this bond is going to effectively like unlock all this, uh, you know, sore debt that is in the system and then the money can resume to circulate because this is eventually an issue. The money is in some certain area is not circulating as it should. So, and I do not understand why like this mechanism that is fairly straightforward, right? Is not a bazooka is not the money is already there in the system. It simply moved from one part to the other of the economy in order to allow the struggling part to recover. Okay. But for whatever reason in the West, like for days, they were like, oh, whatever it takes, like bazooka, $1.8 trillion. Like, this is such an amount of liquidity being injected in, in the markets and so on. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's, like, it's <laughs> totally wrong. It's not true. It's literally not true. And, and today, and I said at that time, like, honestly, this narrative was pushed so crazily by some specific media. But, and then they were bringing like this hedge fund manager like on air and the people were like, oh, I'm not bullish enough on China. Like I'm going to be overexposed on China stocks and whatever. And it's clear that, you know, the stock market in China has never been a yardstick to measure the success of government policies. The increase in stock prices it's eventually a consequence of a healthy economy generating uh, revenues that become dividend and more economic wealth, and that's reflect to stock. But the China economy, as of today, is not over financialized as it is in other economies. And I tell you, like in China, people they don't really like watch the stocks tick by tick or uh, markets news and so on. Frankly, it's uh, it's quite the opposite. If there are big moves in the market, maybe people talk about it a little. But in reality, the, the day-to-day life uh, of these people like doesn't change. It's a matter of fact, the, 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 the stock market in China as still as a connotation of, I know it sounds simplistic to say, but the vast majority of the population consider like trading stocks as gambling. 
effectively. So it doesn't have that, you know, good connotation of that has been built in, in the latest years in the West. Oh, I'm a trader, I have a portfolio or whatever. Like people in China, they invest in hard things. Okay. They like to invest in businesses. When they accumulate money, they reinvest in expanding this business and so on. And as we discussed in the previous podcast, culturally speaking, there is also a very important shift. And at that time, I don't think I express it very well. But one thing that the government really pushed a lot and honestly pushed very successfully is that before, like made in China, in particular from the West, was labeled as like, you know, cheap, but poor quality, blah, 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 and all these kind of things. And the government, it, it pushed a great change of mindset that is in line to, you know, inspire like pride in all the 1.4 billion people that is made by Chinese. So now people in China are buying and almost exclusively made by Chinese goods that stand for cheap reliability and high quality. And myself, when I went in Europe, in Italy, I started to see high sense air conditioners. You start to see like so many people having Huawei phone. You start to see Xiaomi, like gadget tools everywhere. People started to buy Chinese cars in Europe to an extent that the governments got so scared. Okay. So on and so forth. So, and this is becoming a problem for the Western economies because if you remember, and here I conclude on this part, all the narrative in the previous years was like, oh, China is going to become so rich and Chinese people are going to become a consumer economy and they're going to buy Western goods at Western prices. It couldn't have been more wrong. First of all, those Western goods were actually produced in China. First point. Second point is that, as I explained, is that why do I need to pay overpriced priced goods to show a brand, okay, to show off my status while the very same factories that were producing those, those goods, now they have their own brands and label. For example, one is a keep, okay, for sports goods, okay? And people don't understand one very strong cultural thing of Chinese people. They are always good. They're down to their soul to maximize the value for money of things they get. So here is the thing. So this great misconception is, you know, was completely wrong. And then all those people that, you know, on false premises, like had made in uh, made investments or uh, tried to push some narratives or try to speculate on, on things that never made sense, now are like, you know, dealing with the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> that was a wonderful kind of assessment of, of two very important areas. Uh, in China, it's very, very poorly understood. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, and obviously the issue of the bonds or the issuance of them, People just apply this kind of Western way of thinking and looking at China. And as I've always said to people for uh, as long as I've been there, look at China through the eyes of China, not through the eyes of the West, because if you do, you'll completely misunderstand what's going on. So as soon as someone sees the word stimulus, they immediately go, oh, they must be doing what we do in the West, which means... They're going to print loads of money and pump stock markets and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and absolutely not. And this was addressing as part of a long-term 
commitment to resolve these bubbles and, and problems that existed in commercial real estate, in terms of what I might term retail real estate. And so therefore they were fixing problems in the economy and fixing problems in the financial system in a very mature very, uh, you know, very, as you say, quite simple way, but very effectively. And, you know, and for me, the timing is very interesting because I think China's trying to resolve uh, the problems it has, which it certainly does. And that's one bubble that was out of control because they're mindful of what's happening in the Western world and they want to get as many of their ducks lined up and sort out their own internal problems as, as a kind of prelude to what they expect is going to happen in the West. So I think that's an extremely important point. And then the point regarding consumption, you're absolutely correct. And this is something people in the West didn't understand. They don't understand what consumption in the Chinese economy means. They don't understand how China spent quite a few years now rotating its economy away from its traditional model to as also just to be more high tech and to be in the future growth of, uh, in terms of industrial production, etc., which they're doing very successfully. And, you know, I can give a simple example when you talk about <clears throat> quality of Chinese products. I, and I've said this to Dario before, I have this silly habit of collecting t-shirts. It's <laughs> just a bit of a hobby, I guess. And there was a site in China and I bought a number of t-shirts from them. Now I paid the equivalent of 10 euros each, but the quality of them and they're made in China was probably something in the West you would, you would expect to pay 50 euros, maybe even more. And that's exactly highlights in a very simple way, the point you're making. Yeah, this is, uh, this is exactly right. And honestly, the fact that, China is, you know, is, you know, these things are starting to, to, to trickle outside. This, this week there was the news of uh, Amazon that now they will launch their um, marketplace for basically like goods up to $20 to compete with the like of uh, Shane. So why they are doing that is because in while in China, people get very good value for money. The reality in that is that in Europe and US, people don't have money anymore. No. <laughs> so, so they're like, the, the, the problem there is this. And I was talking to, to a friend, like, he's like, how can they expect me to pay 150 euro for just a pair of walking shoes, okay, that is nothing like really special and has a brand attached to it. And then I go to Shane and I find like equivalent shoes for like 30 euro. And then he gets it, you know, it was a bit skeptical at the beginning. He tried, it's like, shit, it's actually done very good. So, I mean, in Europe and US, it's, you know, the, the shift that is happening, it should be like taken into consideration because people are maxed out, in particular in Europe, where you don't have the line of credit uh, that they enjoy in US. So the fact that Amazon is making this move is an acknowledgement that while effectively what the Chinese government is doing for the Chinese people, they don't care about like external countries. The focus has always been the Chinese people, is working. I mean, tomorrow I go again to Shenzhen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I tell you this, you know how much I paid for one night in a five-star hotel in the prime area. I paid 600 renminbi, like 100 US. The exact same hotel chain 
if you check in Milan, London, or whatever, in Milan, the exact same hotel chain is a thousand euro a night, and the rooms are minuscule because they're like older buildings, usually. So this is exactly like you know what people in the West don't understand, but now they are being forced by the the necessities you know, to scale to scale back and effectively they are shifting towards a mentality that is becoming closer to the Chinese one of seeking better value for money rather than the all out consumerism that it was so much invoked for many years you, you get what i mean right yes absolutely and you know the funny thing where do you expect amazon is going to source those goods produced <laughs> um, and sell sold for maximum $20 i mean for china of course <laughs> yes of course yes ironically yeah so what what, what they're going to do they're going to put tariffs on shoes they're going to like put uh, 200% tariffs on shoes so the nike produced shoes shoes in china sold in the US for $200, they can be at the same price of Chinese brand produced in China and sold in US. Do you, do you realize how nonsensical this is? And I really enjoyed like this chart this week that shows the monetary surplus that China has every year because as we discussed, basically Chinese people are spending money in China. And for the fact that they produce and export for the rest of the world, they keep getting this inflow of currency and this economic surplus. And because they're, you know, their own mindset, they always strive for efficiency, even lower costs and so on. That honestly was not very different from, from the Japanese mindset of the 80s to a certain, to a certain extent. Like these people are becoming more and more competitive, more and more technologically advanced. In the meantime, outside, like Europe, US, and others are falling backwards. So what are they going to do? Like you cannot, uh, it's simply like, you know, everything that is said, in my opinion, is so completely nonsensical. Yeah, absolutely. And and this ties in in the West. The problem we have is we are completely maxed out on debt. We're really maxed out on being able to give people higher wages because we just can't economically compete uh, globally. But also, you know, if you want to impose tariffs on China, well, fine. But if China, as I crudely say, produces a widget for a dollar, and you in the United States, it costs five dollars, it might cost ten dollars. Even if you put 200 percent tariffs on the Chinese widget, it's still cheaper than buying it from, from a producer inside the United States. I mean, so the idea that the West can compete with these low cost models, with uh, and also because we're so maxed out on debt in the West, and Whereas, as you rightly say, in China, they're a nation of prolific savers. And therefore, yeah. they spend the money they've earned. It's, they're not spending debt. So, you know, and, and they're not managing enormous amounts of debt, of personal debt in the process. So it's a very, very different mindset that people in the West don't understand where we're all encouraged and have been for a very long time to, well, what's the problem? Just take out some more debt. Well, why don't you remortgage your house? Or the one, as someone was talking to me yesterday about this, take some equity out your property. <laughs> I mean, these, the, and I said to them, absolutely do not do that under any circumstances and explain why. And when they understood, they went, no, I won't do that. Because this was quite a significant amount of money. So, you know, it's those kind of mindsets we have in the West. And we think, that's how China is, and it's exactly the opposite. And therefore, the Chinese economy is very geared to all these enormous changes it's made in recent years. I mean, it's been rotating its economy in, in these ways. And 
in the process still achieving very significant growth, which apparently is a collapse according to the West. But if we look at our growth and what and, and compare it to Chinese growth where they actually have genuine real growth where we just recycle bits of, of paper and call it growth. We call massive government spending growth, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't contribute to China's economy, but they have a tangible economy and have done for 20 plus years that actually serves the nation extremely well and is something the West sacrificed as part of that whole financialization of our economy, which was a complete disaster. So I think it's very important for people to understand the reality of China and, and realize what they're doing and why it is hugely significant. And the idea the West can somehow take on China and destroy it economically is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, that's totally correct. And uh, actually, I'd like to use one item that uh, you mentioned to shift to the, to the second part of, sure. of, uh, of, um, of our talk today. You mentioned um, how the private debt in China is super low, almost, uh, you know, I wouldn't say non-existent, but it, it's mm. really it's really low. While, for example, in well, in US we know it's super high, like eighteen trillion dollar. I mean, it's a complete nonsense. But there is one particular country that right now is starting to make some headlines for the wrong reason, and it's Germany. And why I want to touch upon Germany because uh, Germany is another topic that, in my opinion, is is greatly misunderstood. So for everyone, Germany is like this rigorous economy. They have a low public debt to GDP, triple A rating, uh, and everything is on Kidori, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I talk to these people, just buy a ticket and go to Germany and take a look. Okay. Is it really like that? I mean, of course, the country is not in a chaos or whatever. But when you start to talk to the people living in Germany, going to the grocery store every day, they, they bought an apartment that they have to send kids to school and, and whatnot. Their cost of life is going through the roof. And furthermore, one, pe one thing that people don't know and is never in into the news is that actually Germany as a private debt to GDP as a ratio that at the moment as per latest statistic is like north of 170 percent of the GDP so you know like this should be an eye opener for people because in the appearance you have something that resembles a very strong economy that can sail through hard times but in reality like this is going to be officially the second year with no growth in germany okay the second year in a row if you check the industrial statistics is a complete nightmare i mean some sentiment statistics in Germany right now, they are so low or they are even negative already. They are even lower than the lows reached during the COVID pandemic. And I find incredible people are ignoring that. Aren't we supposed to be in a booming market with uh, <laughs> DAX at all time high and whatever? So why, like, what, what's wrong with this data? And somehow no one asked themselves this question. And furthermore, while I was traveling in Germany, I discovered one thing that, that personally I, 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 I didn't know it was to that extent, is that Germany, because of this sense of security, sense of, uh, you know, German people are like regals and, and whatnot and so on. That is true. Okay, I'm not saying it's not true. 
But in reality, what has been created like in the past years, there is a huge market, a huge market for subprime debt and mortgages between residential and commercial real estate. I mean, it's quite, once you see the data, and uh, perhaps I, I will share that article with you because there, I put so many data there. The numbers are incredible, okay? And people think that Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank are the German economy or the German financial system. It couldn't be more wrong. German financial system, in reality, is made by thousands and thousands of micro banks, effectively, that in German are called, if I'm correct, Sparkassen. Yeah, right? yeah. And sometimes they may have even just a couple of branch and so on. So they are very local. And all these like micro bank, they essentially do two things with their assets, okay? Their liquidity. They buy German government debt, boons, and they provide mortgages, okay? But then what's, what was the problem for many years? is that at some point, I think the 30-year boon was trading at what? 0.4% yield? Something like that. So, I mean, of course, they you know, they were still buying boons, okay, because the funding rate was negative and whatever, but in reality, that was not covering the expenses. So they started with all this pile of liquidity that was printed by the CB at the time. They started to really land crazily, okay? And then, because in Germany, actually, there is a very old market for um, effectively loans and uh, uh, covered bonds uh, with mortgages, okay? And what happened is that, of course, pension funds and insurances, they were stuck with this yield so low. And they had policies they they had to yield like three or four percent. Well, so what they started to do, they started to bid, you know, for this type of assets. Okay, and this created a huge bubble that honestly is not that different from the one that U.S. faced during the GFC. But the real difference here is that apparently no one knows about it. Uh, is there in the data, is there in the books, is there into the, you know, um, overdue payments to banks and whatnot, but it's still like completely unknown. And we're talking about hundreds of billions, if not trillions. So, and the reason why like all these assets and whatever, they still have such a high rating and it's a problem of the rating Per se, everyone that knows rating knows that the rating, one big component of the rating for private issuers is the country rating. Okay. So Germany in appearance is triple A. And that created a huge amount of private debt with incredibly like high rating, like triple A, double A plus, double A and whatnot, that in reality are deep subprime. And what happens when people like stop paying these mortgages? What happens when they cannot, you know, they're stuck in a house they cannot afford and they cannot sell it because the real estate market is through the floor as the one it is in Germany. If you see the statistics of the, the real estate market in, in Germany is, is really appealing. So long story short, yeah, there is like this, you know, government crisis now in Germany and whatever. But if you see the government bond market, there is not, you know, people are really dismissing the risk. But something happened. Something very big happened last week. And you were the one that rightly highlighted that. Is that the spread between 10 years euro swap and 
the 10 year bond, that is the 10 year euro basis, became negative. What does that mean? That means that effectively the market is starting to price a higher risk into German government bonds that as a assets by itself are becoming like are starting to struggle to be pristine collateral in the market and for whatever reason is it's being ignored well yeah but that's a, <laughs> we've seen that through throughout even modern history just go back to the subprime crisis in well, before 2008, quite a few years before 2008, when it was obviously happening. And, you know, at the time, I remember in 2006, saying we, we, we've we got a serious, I didn't call it a global financial crisis because it was a Western financial crisis. It's going to happen. And, you know, nobody listened. No, nobody would look at the raw data and, and see that it was a reality. And then, of course, eventually... 2008 happened and the rest is history but you know we don't learn lessons from history people don't see things like this or see the significance of it and i'm not talking about specifically people who are listening today who may not be uh, work in the financial sector they may not have the expertise or the understanding and this is why obviously dario comes on and explains these things so eloquently and so simply to so people can understand what's going on but that's that's fine, but there's no excuse for people who work in the financial sector to not see this data because it's publicly available and understand the significance and the ramifications of of this. And it's also, you know, we have to factor this in with all the endless economic data coming out of Germany, which is appalling, basically, largely. And we know Germany's being deindustrialized. We know this is largely because. Germany doesn't have access to cheap Russian energy anymore. Okay, f forget the politics of that. And that's just a statement of fact. And we're seeing increasingly examples of German businesses who are actually realizing it's better for them to expand operations in countries like China because the, 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 the basically the cost model, their the ability to produce, you know, whether it's uh, the automaker sector or others, that they can produce a widget, for want of a better word, far cheaper. It's far more cost-effective to than trying to produce the same goods in their own country, in Germany, for example. And also, yes, it's not solely the problem because Germany has neglected the, the future of technology. It's re relied on traditional industry and not realising that as a shelf life. All technology eventually becomes redundant in in various ways or shapes and forms. And this is another example. So it's not entirely the problem, but when you factor in those problems and what's the risk to German people in the future in terms of the, the security of their jobs, is we going to have huge unemployment in Germany? How does that factor into the subprime crisis in the making you've referred to and just the over-indebtedness again of people in the West and people in positions and situations they shouldn't find themselves in. But again, they're encouraged to do so as happened since before 2008 and throughout sort of, I would say the last 30, 40 years, people have been encouraged to take on debt. They can't manage. If there is a problem, there is a downturn in the economy. If suddenly they lose their job and, you know, it's very important that people understand why this is a problem but also you know with the european union being structured the way it is if germany has serious problems it's not going to stay contained in germany i mean this is very obvious i mean okay in very simple terms you can relate to 2008 to understand the ramifications of a of a serious problem that's there it's at it's present we can see it okay at this point it hasn't manifested itself in a way we've seen in 2008 but the risks are there and as ever they get ignored and then people in the future go we didn't know this was going to happen and then you know people like dario can say hang on in 2024 I, I highlighted this very clearly what the problem is and it just demonstrates once again that 
in the West, we have this awful tendency of repeating history with very devastating consequences. Yeah, this is totally true. And, you know, I would like to conclude today with a personal anecdote also to close this second part. I was in uh, in Germany in July and I I was in this, like, very small town, like 2,000 people. They didn't even have a supermarket, okay? They only, like, uh, kind of, like, a uh, supermarket they had. They had this, um, the moment, I, I forgot the name, but it's, like, a... Uh, uh, container that's completely automated okay people go in and they can buy like some groceries and some like uh, um you know like soaps and like basic things and uh, the closest supermarket is at um, around like 20 minute drive and i speak to this couple and this couple bought an apartment there for 2 million euros like three years ago during COVID. And the shocking things to me is that it's not just, just the price per se. I was like, oh, that, that's really high. I mean, I come from Hong Kong and in, in Hong Kong, the prices are insane. But the shocking things to me is that in, in the couple, one member of the couple had a part-time job for 3,000 euro a month. And the other had a full-time job for 2,500 euro a month. And they put no upfront for the, pay, for, for the mortgage. I'm like, and I asked them, how, 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 is, how is this possible? Okay. And then they explained me, like, oh, but here is very common. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, yeah, like they give you like, 30 year mortgage for 50 percent and then for the other 50 percent you get a two-year loan but no worries like it's a, it's a no-brainer you're gonna refinance that and i was like completely in, in shock i mean so basically you have i mean this debt mathematically speaking i mean these people will have to work for their own life assuming stable and continuous employment in order to repay this mortgage and this made me realize one thing is that the way that the housing market became in particular in the west is that people are like oh you buy an house it's apartment it's fine it's going to increase in price but what they don't realize is that yeah but if you, if you consider the interest you're going to pay on the mortgage, the one that is going to benefit for that price increase is not going to be you. It's going to be the bank. And if for whatever reason you stop paying the mortgage at any point in time, they will repossess 100% of your house and sell it at a distressed price, pay themselves. And if there is anything less left, and most of the times there is nothing left, you may get something. So, I mean, this is a complete extreme, in my opinion. And I believe, I didn't run the numbers also because it's very hard to get. There is a huge amount of people that got mortgages. But currently, in particular in Germany, because the house pricing collapsed, they are a negative equity. So they are effectively like throwing money into a into a bonfire. But banks like it, the financial system like it, the official data looks good till these people, they raise a white flag and they say, you know what, cannot do this anymore. So I'm going to default. And I tell you, when you start seeing rich people defaulting on their mortgages, and I'm talking about what is happening right now in Hong Kong? There was actually an article in the in the newspaper this 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 week, but I I knew it already. Is that all these trophy houses that were bought for millions, tens of millions, and whatever on the peak? People are simply saying to the bank, you know what, no worth anymore. Take it. I walk away. When you start seeing these kind of things, in particular in wealthy economies, you gotta be scared. 
my opinion. And no one is uh, really, really looking into this issue that is effectively a big social ticking time bomb. Yeah, absolutely. And that, yeah, that's a very good example of financialization in action. Financialization, people think, oh, it, it benefits me. Oh, look, I can buy, as you say, an apartment for some exorbitant price, which is fueled by financialization because we need ever growing asset bubbles. And people don't understand that ultimately they're the victim, they're on the hook for everything. And if things go wrong, which inevitably they will do because financialization is not real economic growth. You're back to that point. You need to produce goods and sell them and sell them at a profit. You can't recycle bits of paper and debt, call it financialization, have asset bubbles that are absolutely meaningless and call it economic growth. And for the likes of you and I and anyone else in this position, to partake in, in transactions in that financial system that actually puts us at serious jeopardy in the future because, as you say, you have a lifetime commitment. And a lot can happen in the next two or three years in Europe or in Germany, never mind what might happen in the next 30 years or people have 40 years. And some people are talking about having 50-year mortgages. I mean, it's just absurd, but that's... I think in Canada it's like ninety years. Yeah. I read. <laughs> yeah, so. and they, they're even they're even negative amortizing. I mean, your mortgage is increasing. So, like, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete distortion. It's a, it's not even mathematically. Like you cannot even price it properly as a risk. This this, this type of situations. No, it's, yeah, <clears throat> there's no price you can put. It's just absurd. And But, of course, you know, people get sucked into the euphoria of it because, <clears throat> you know, they want to own a house at all costs. Well, all costs can sometimes be too, is, can be too big a price to pay, and given where we are now, that is increasingly going to be a problem. And, you know, we, we risk having exactly the same problem as we had in 2008. And but with a whole myriad of other problems that you've discussed, I've discussed, and other people have discussed in the last since 2008, and all the the excesses, the the risk, and everything that they've allowed to to occur in the financial system, which means that all the problems we had in 2008 will seem like a drop in the ocean in comparison. I'm not trying to frighten people. This is a statement of fact, and uh, and it's good you know, for, to get people like Dario to come on and to discuss his understanding, which is very deep. He understands the financial system, the plumbing. He's aware of what's happening in places and things that most people don't understand. And given the interconnected nature of the financial world, what happens in China or what happens in Germany is, is very relevant in a broader context. And particularly, for example, what happens in Germany with respect to the European Union, with respect to the euro. Totally correct. I'm uh, very happy to have this opportunity um, given by you to, to, to talk, to reach your audience. And I, and I hope they, they spread the word because, uh, as I keep saying, like, you know, it, it, it's better to you know, get prepared when you still have the chance to rather than you know when the problem occurs then you're stuck and then other people are going to decide for you yeah absolutely yeah well dario thank you very much for joining us again it's been a real pleasure i find it very interesting what you're discussing and i know the audience do and we look forward to doing more of these i would call them more chats i don't like the word interview it sounds very uh, very formal and i don't think this platform is supposed to be formal uh obviously in terms of this our site on youtube we'd like you to support us in the future so like share subscribe put comments in and please spread the word and let uh, this what we want to do in the future with dario so more and more people get to listen and they can hear his very eloquent way of explaining complicated things very simply, but also having his finger on the pulse of things that 
most people are not even remotely aware of, but are extremely important that they should be. So thanks again, Dario. Thanks to you.